Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Greetings, saints. Thank you so much for joining us for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Let's ask the Father for his blessings, since I'm a very poor preacher without him. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask for your grace today, your mercy, your discernment. We ask, Lord, that you uh, bring all things to my remembrance, that you'd have me to say, Lord, thank you so much, God, for your mercy, and thank you so much for drawing us unto you. Thank you for these latter days, Lord, in which you're going to do a great revival among your people. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We're excited about what you're about to do, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I thought I'd share a little bit with you uh, concerning God's plan for evangelism. And um, as you know, the things that have been are the things that shall be, so we know a little bit about God's plan just from reading the Gospels in the book of Acts, because that's what God's going to do in these days. And uh, what God did worked. Uh, what we've done since hasn't. And it's because men thought they knew better. Uh, men left off being filled with God's Spirit and with His Word and, and uh, created a bunch of religions, kind of like it was in Jesus' day, so we're, we're right on time with that, you know. And Jesus, of course, came with the uh, former rain anointing uh, in order to raise up some disciples in his image. Not only did he preach to the multitudes in order to uh, give them the understanding of this new covenant, but he also took an awful lot of time with uh, 12 disciples in order to make apostles of them that he could send forth to do his work. And um, he wanted them, of course, to represent him, so he trained them very specifically. And when he got through training them, he anointed them with the Holy Spirit. And of course, then was their job to go forth and to um, uh, raise up the church, the called out ones those that were called out of the denominations of that day and uh, to follow him and to be disciples of, of Jesus Christ. And of course, those, uh, those 12 that he was so particular to raise up, uh, one of them fell away, so he ended up with 11. They replaced one. They, these 12 were the, the seed uh, to raise up the fivefold ministry. That was their job, uh, and to make disciples. And once again, we're going to go down that exact same path here. I believe it's very possible that the, uh, the uh, John the Baptist ministry has already begun, and that in a short time, the, the man-child ministry will do the works of Jesus in raising up apostles to once again go forth and raise up the fivefold ministry in his image. Why would that be necessary? Because we already have a fivefold ministry. Well, because most of these people aren't sent. And that was the same problem in Jesus' day. The, uh, the thieves and the robbers came up another way. And as John chapter 10 tells us. So I'm going to start here in the, what people call the Great Commission, uh, which is of course going to be repeated in our day. And in verse 16, we're told, But the eleven disciples went into Galilee, unto the mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Now, Jesus sent disciples, and when he sent the disciples, he called them apostles, because that means one sent forth. But Jesus never sent anybody but disciples. And a disciple, of course, is a, a learner and a follower. A learner of the the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ, and a follower of the Word of God. If you find someone who, who goes to uh, bring the gospel or evangelize or teach or anything else, and they're not a disciple, meaning they're not a learner, 
and a follower to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ, then they just went and they weren't sent. So, But Jesus is about to send the people that he had renewed their mind with the word of God. He had imparted his spirit to them by the words that he spoke unto them, which he said were spirit and life. And, uh, and now he was about to anoint them with the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, so that they could go forth and, and replicate himself, his work in the earth. Oh, hallelujah. This is what we need once again, you know. So these 11 disciples went to the place that he had appointed them, the mountain, which I, I, I believe represents the kingdom of God. And when they saw him, uh, they worshiped him, but, but some doubted. Oh, that nasty doubt, it'll show up even with people that have been walking side by side with Jesus for three and a half years, you know. And Jesus came to them and spake unto them, saying, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of all nations. You know, the Lord brought a great revival, a great explosion of evangelism. Many people came into the kingdom. Many people learned to walk in the steps of Jesus. It was just awesome until the falling away, right? Which they all prophesied, Paul and Jesus and all prophesied this. Uh, verse 20 says, teaching them to observe I don't like the word observe here. It's probably, in our language, not the right word uh, to translate. Uh, you would call this hold fast. Or like in the numerics, says keep. So when you say teaching them to keep all things whatsoever I commanded you, or hold fast to all things which I commanded you, uh, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world or end of the age. Wow, this is a command to go into all the world and uh, preach the gospel. Of course, Jesus' plan was kind of like a geometric progression. Jesus himself couldn't do what he sent those 12 disciples out to do or apostles out to do, but they, carrying the gospel in different directions and, and raising up the fivefold ministry and uh, raising up multitudes of Christians who, who also had a spirit of evangelism on them. I mean, evangelism was very important in the early church. It's going to be, once again, very important in the latter church. But the way the Nicolaitan church works, they mostly leave all that up to the pastor or some evangelist to handle. They don't take it seriously. You know, evangelism is a job not only for those who have the office of evangelist, but for everyone. Everyone has a job to do in evangelism. And once the church realizes this and also realizes that we really tru are, truly are in the latter days, they're going to take this seriously. Not only that, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to empower them to uh, bring the gospel to the whole world. Praise God. That's what the Lord said was going to happen. So, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. That is the first disciples. Today, we've got no right to preach anything else. You know, I mean, it was called the everlasting gospel. We were warned not to add to it or take away from it under penalty of a curse in the end of the book of Revelation. And so, everything that Jesus commanded them, he still commands us. You can see it very plainly. And if you're making disciples um, after the order of the first disciples, then if you've got a, a leadership that is not walking in this, then they can't teach you to walk in this, and they're not going to lead you to walk in this because they're not going to lead you to walk in something that they're not, and they can't give you something that they don't have. So so basically, the Lord Jesus taught these men, these uh, now 11 men at this time, uh, because they'd lost Judas, uh, he had taught them um, how to walk in his steps, in his power, with his anointing, and to speak his words. He had taught them that. And um, again, a geometric progression. We've got to get back to that, and God is going to bring us back to that. He's going to bring us back through the latter rain to this. So we're just um, 
so happy. Let, let me go to Mark 16 and read a few verses to you there. Uh, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Some people want to preach to people that it's easy to preach to, but uh, the Lord is basically saying he wants us to share it with everybody. Nobody's going to be condemned for for um, not hearing it. They're going to be condemned for hearing it and not doing it. So he wants us to preach the gospel to the whole creation. Nothing has changed, okay? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. And these signs shall accompany them that believe. And nothing has changed from this either. It doesn't matter that the church is totally blackslidden and it doesn't believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit, with the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit of God. It doesn't matter because they're not the called out ones, you know. If they are the called out ones, they're not coming out. So what he's mentioning here is common signs that all believers... Now, there are many, many signs in the Scriptures that are not listed here, but these are common signs that all believers can enter into. And he said, These signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And, of course, in Luke chapter 10, 19 and 20, he's telling you that serpents represent serpent spirits. He tells you that these are spirits. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall in no wise hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Every believer has a right to do these things, and they should be entering into these things and being filled with the power of the Spirit. Uh, most importantly, you can't do the work of God unless God does it in you, and that's why God sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk in His steps. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, we're coming to a great revival, you know. It's going to start out the same way, uh, a geometric progression, the, the man-child ministry, which is now a corporate body of people who are the first fruits to come into His image. We're all planned to and given a gift to enter into His image. They're not not any more special than the rest. It's just that they're the first fruits to enter into this. And, of course, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the only one that can do the work. He does this through His Holy Spirit. We cannot deny His Holy Spirit. We cannot deny His gifts. If we do, we are not taking part in this great revival that the Lord wants to do. Okay? Um, there's one more quality, I believe, that the Lord wants in His people besides education and anointing, and He mentions that in the commission in uh, John 21. Let me read it to you. In verse 15, So when they had broken their fast, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? Now the problem was, of course, that when Jesus was crucified, uh, these guys went back to fishing. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But they went back to fishing. That isn't what the Lord trained them to do. No matter how disappointed they were, that wasn't what he trained them to do. And, um, and Peter himself had, had just denied the Lord three times. So he was feeling a little guilty here, a little bit of condemnation on his shoulders. And Jesus said, Lovest thou me? Love here is the word agape, uh, deep love, godly love. Uh, lovest thou me more than these? I guess he's talking about the fish, you know. And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love, and he's using the word phileo, which is uh, uh, a lower form of love. I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. If you love me, Feed my lambs. This is important to Jesus. Feed my lambs. If you really love Jesus, you will feed his lambs. Right? You know, who are his lambs? And uh, is he talking about Christians there? Or is he talking about non-Christians? Well, that's a good, that's an important thing. First of all, let me point out that 
evangelism is to the lost. An evangelist is one who has an office to reach the lost. He doesn't have any office as far as a, a dominion in the church. His dominion is to reach out from the church to the lost. Okay. Now, the teachers and the uh, prophets and the apostles, they had authority to exercise in the church. But who is his lambs? You know, you might be surprised what the Lord means by this. I'm going to go back in uh, John 10 and point something out to you. Let's see. Let's start in verse um, 12. He that is a hireling and not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, Beholdeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf snatcheth them, and scattereth them. He fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. Well, we just discovered that if you really love Jesus, you're going to take care of his lambs, right? That's part of it. He's a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. In other words, he has another ambition. Many people in the ministry nowadays are like that. They have titles, and uh, they're very um, egotistical. They're in it for their own ego, their own ambition, their own um, uh, monetary reasons, you know, but they don't, they're not necessarily there because they love the sheep. And uh, it doesn't take long before you find out if they really love the sheep, okay? And I am the good shepherd, and I know mine own, and mine own know me, even as the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I dare say there's no difference today, folks. Uh, you know, Jesus is still here. He's still laying down his life for the sheep. He said, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So, I mean, any, any shepherd who's not laying down his life is not the good shepherd. You know, and he says, I laid down my life for the sheep and other sheep I have. Notice this and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. So they haven't come to him yet, but he calls them his sheep because they were his sheep from the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible says. He said, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. They haven't even heard his voice yet, but he calls them his sheep because he foreknew them before the foundation of the world. Now, now there are people that will do the, some of the signs and wonders and miracles and prophesy by thy name, and by thy name do many mighty works, but he will say to them, I never knew you. And... Um, the, the people that the Lord knew from the foundation of the world are the ones that he foresaw were going to be with him at the end, the ones that were going to bear fruit. He knew them. He has known them from the beginning. They're his sheep. Not that many others won't be given the opportunity, but they won't bear fruit. See, the Lord's coming to pick the fruit. He's coming to pick those that he foreknew. That means he knew them before, okay? This is what the Bible says. You can go look that up for yourself. I'm not going to study that right now, but he said, they shall hear my voice. They shall become one flock, one shepherd. Now listen to this. Therefore doth the Father love me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. And no one taketh it away from me, but I lay it down of myself. The Father loves Jesus because Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. Okay, uh, he was the good shepherd because he laid down his life for the sheep. So back in our text, you can see why he demands the same thing of, of his disciples, of anybody, anyone that he sends. You know, he trained these men and he sent them and he didn't want them going back to fishing. They had some much more important fishing to do. And Peter said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Then tend my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved 
because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Well, I think this was a mild rebuke because as soon as Jesus was out of the way, they weren't continuing on to do what they were trained to do. And that he had worked so hard for three and a half years to train these men up to do this. And they would go back to fishing when Jesus was gone. And I believe that's what this rebuke is. If you really love me, your livelihood is not the most important thing. Your ambition is not the most important thing. Uh, your wishes are not the most important thing. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? That's what he said unto him. And now he wants to know, if you really love me, then you're going to feed my sheep. You know, and is that not true for, I know it was true for these disciples, but it was also true for the church as a whole. The church as a whole was evangelistic in nature. No, they weren't all ordained to the office of, of evangelists, but they definitely did the work of an evangelist, as Paul told Timothy, right? And we should all desire that because we know what salvation is and we have this gift to give to people around us, this gift of the Lord Jesus Christ to give unto them that they might enter into the kingdom and have eternal life. What can be more important than that? Not our selfish ambitions, you know, not our job as Peter was going back to his old job here, you know. The Lord said, no, no, if you love me, take care of my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, you did what you wanted to do when you were young. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. So these disciples would give their, end up giving their lives for the sheep. Uh, of course, it, you know, I'm sure that there were times when they wanted to hide out. <laughs> from the persecution, you know, but the Lord um, trained them up to walk in his steps. And they were good shepherds like he was. And they gave their lives for the sheep. Now this he spake, signifying by what manner of death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So if we are truly a disciple, we're going to follow him. And if we truly love him, we're going to have an interest in what he has an interest in. The fact that he was leaving and this was more important to him uh, than a lot of other things that he could say, called the Great Commission, uh, lets you know that it's still important to him today. And that's why he is um, returning, according to Hosea 6, 1 through 3, on the morning of the third day as the rain, as the latter rain that watereth the earth. He's coming to his people as the latter rain upon his disciples to once again raise up a geometric progression of bringing many, many souls into the kingdom. And the church has gone astray, basically. Uh, the Nicolaitan air, they're, um, you know, warming a pew and doing lots of things, but they're not taking seriously this evangelistic call and command of the Lord, right? So I think we need to repent. And I believe that the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes upon us is going to do this. I'm going to read a little bit of 1 John chapter 4 to you. In verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is begotten or born of God and knoweth God. So if we're born of God, we're going to love one another. No, born of God is not what the church has taught us. They've taught basically you just accept Jesus as your Savior, now you're born again. Well, yes, you're born again in your spirit, but that's not born again. Born again is not only born again in your spirit, it's born again in your obedience to the truth in your soul. That's what Peter says, and uh, and ultimately, of course, born again in body when you have uh, uh, borne the fruit of that spirit in your soul. He wants us to bear fruit. After we're born of the spirit, 
having a born-again spirit. He wants us to bear the fruit in our soul. That is our mind, our will, and our emotions. These men did that followed Jesus. They were disciples. You can't be a disciple without bearing fruit in your soul. And so, you know, if you have the love of God in you, it's going to be very important to tell people about Jesus. Verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Herein was the love of God manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Now, so here is how God's love is manifested. You know, Jesus wasn't the only Son. He was the only born Son, only begotten Son. All of us are reborn sons. But it's the same situation. You know, I'll read it again for sons. God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Once again, God's Son does still live in this world, you know, because Jesus means God with us, right? That was His original name, was God with us. So He is with us, and He is still loved of the Father because He gives up His life for the sheep. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Amen. Without Jesus having died for us, we would not be able to be what we're going to be. We would not be able to enter into who He is because He was given to us as a gift from God. And down in verse 19 it says, We love because He first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, cannot love God, whom he hath not seen. Well, here it is. You know, if we're going to love our brother, we can love God. If we can't love our brother, we can't love God. We have many brethren that are still in the world. Uh, they're, they're either in the world through dead religion. Uh, Jesus came very much to evangelize the lost Jews. Uh, he came unto his own. His own received him not. He came into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He sent out his disciples first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, they loved their brethren. They, uh, Paul spoke about how he would uh, give up his life um, for the brethren. And uh, many people today who are true disciples of Jesus Christ are giving up their life for the brethren. You know, they give up what they could have, what they could do, what they, the rest of the worldly people do go after, and even the worldly church goes after. They give up these things because they love God and they love His people. And this commandment have we from Him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So if you love God, you're going to love your brother. Even if he's one of those brothers that Jesus spoke about in John chapter 10 who are still in the world, haven't even heard the word yet, that he said would come to him. They said, he said they were his sheep at that time. They've always been his sheep. So we're simply finding out who are those sheep. You know, who are the called? He that's of God hears the words of God. You know, we, we love to share the gospel because then we find out who they are and we see them come out of the world with the joy of salvation, so on and so forth. And chapter 5 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is, is born of God or begotten of God. And whosoever loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. If you say you love God, you have to love your brothers. You have to bro love your sisters. There's so much hatred in the church, so much uh, dissension, so much uh, slander, so much anger and strife and sectarianism, you know, in the church. And all of that's totally contrary to love, and it just proves that the people don't love God. Yeah. Hereby we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and do His commandments. So if we're going to be obedient to Jesus and we're going to walk in His steps and we're going to be disciples, learners and followers, or mathetes, a learner and a follower, then this is the only way we can really love our brethren, right? 
And if we're going to love our brethren, then we have to be obedient to God. In the, even in this call of uh, evangelism. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 14. Now, this is Paul. He just got through speaking about how that the Lord had um, set forth these apostles, last of all, men doomed to death. Uh, they're made a spectacle to the world, you know. Um, they were defamed. Uh, they were made as the filth of the world, he said, and the offscouring of all things, even until the time that he's speaking here. And then he says in verse 14, he says, I write not these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So Paul has children. You know, some people say God doesn't have any grandchildren. Well, in a way, that's true. We're all children of God it's because it's the same seed that brings us all forth. But it's not quite true in another way. Let me point that out to you. For though ye have 10,000 tutors in Christ, ye have not many fathers. It's true. For in Christ Jesus I begat you through the gospel. So here's a father. Here's a father who was actually a child of God himself, who had received the seed of God himself. And now he was sowing this seed. You might say he was making grandchildren, you know, because they were his children. You know, he had he had sowed the seed, but he received that seed first from his father, right? And we too, you know, we receive the seed of God, which is the word of God, and we sow this this word in others, and we beget them unto Christ with that word. And uh, in a way, there are children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, all the way down. Uh, a geometric progression. You know, whole tribes were created from just one seed. They started out as just one seed, but because they were all, uh, in, in the Old Testament, in a natural way, you became a Jew through physical inheritance. But now it's through spiritual inheritance, and it's the seed is the Word of God. So, you know, there's only one way we can multiply, folks. Uh, everybody's got to do their job. Every one of us has received the seed of God, and every one of us has to sow the seed of God in order for a tribe to be born, not just an individual. It didn't stop with Abraham, right? For in Christ Jesus I begat you through the gospel. I beseech you, therefore, be ye imitators of me. In other words, okay, I did it, you do it too, right? You know, I sowed the seed, I brought you forth, now you do it, you know? We know that uh, we can do nothing without Christ, but we're not without Christ. We've been given the Great Commission. He's uh, given us authority to speak in His name. He's given us authority to do signs and wonders. All of this is going to return. I mean, there is a great falling away, but the Lord promised through the prophet Joel that He was going to restore all things. You know, and so here we are. We're at the time when God's going to restore all things. And once again, we're going to need to know God's progression of uh, evangelism because God is going to shake the whole world. He is going to bring in multitudes of people in these days. Yes, and at the same time, there's going to be a great falling away, just like there was with Judas and others. But we're looking forward to all of those who were foreknown from the foundation of the world being at the, in the kingdom at the end. He said, I beget you through the gospel. I beseech you, therefore, be ye imitators of me. For this cause... Have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord? So he's sending his child to go and beget children, right? Timothy was his faithful child in the Lord, who shall put you in remembrance of my ways. In other words, Timothy was just going to pass on what was passed on to him, right? He was going to pass on the ways of the Lord, which were passed on to Paul, which were passed on to Timothy, and now Timothy was going to pass them on again, you know, a geometric progression. Every person 
uh, interfaces with many people. And every one of those individuals should be interfacing with many people. It's kind of like a, uh, a coliseum or um, an auditorium or a, um, what would you call it? Because each circle begets a bigger circle. And every, everyone, if they do their job and their part, this thing will explode. It will go all over the earth. And that's the plan. It's going to take a revival, and the Lord is going to take care of that part. He's sending the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that has never been on the earth before. The glory of the latter house is greater than the glory of the former house. The latter rain is going to be greater. It is truly going to be worldwide and, and truly going to be more powerful than the former rain. He said, greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto the Father. So Timothy was going to put them in remembrance of Christ and his ways through Paul. As I teach everywhere in every church, Paul said, you know, glory to God. So there are there is such a thing as grandchildren. Again, it's the same seed, and uh, but it's pretty neat. Let's look in Second Timothy. Um, chapter 4 and verse 5, just for a moment. And uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, he says, But be thou sober in all things. Suffer hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill thy ministry. Well, you know, the thing about Timothy was he was doing the work of an evangelist, but that wasn't even his office. But he's telling him to do the work of an evangelist. You know, First Thessalonians, let me read that to you. Chapter 2 and verse 6. Nor seeking glory of men, neither from you nor from others, when we might have claimed authority as apostles of Christ. Now, I know some people think there were only 12 apostles, but that's just not true. There's... Uh, at least 24, maybe 25 mentioned in the scriptures. And um, because if you use the word apostolos the same way, then you realize that that's the truth. Because some theologian thought we should only translate it one way because it's the 12 and another way if it's someone else, that don't make sense. It's not even honest. Okay. So in this case, he was talking about we might have claimed authority as apostles. We, who's we? Well, if you go back to verse 1, it says, Paul and Silvanus, which I believe was Silas, same as Silas, Paul and Silas, and Timothy unto the church. They were writing unto the church of the Thessalonians. And he continued to speak in the plural. Uh, all of them were speaking here. Uh, verse 2, we give thanks unto God always for you all. So when he was talking about we over here in Chapter 2 and verse 6, he was speaking about Paul and Silvanus or Silas and Timothy as apostles. Yes, uh, Timothy was a junior apostle, but he was an apostle. He was sent forth. You know, many of the apostles actually were uh, teachers or prophets who were sent forth. And, um, I mean, they started out as uh, one ordination and received another ordination and they went forth to raise up the church that was their job and to raise up the fivefold ministry and to ordain the fivefold ministry that's what apostles do in the scriptures that's who uh, ordained fivefold ministers and here he said to Titus here in uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 for this cause I left thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and appoint elders in every city, and as, and as I gave thee a charge. So, um, Titus was also an apostle. Let's see. Do the work of an evangelist. Now, here's an apostle doing the work of it. Is it not all of our jobs to do the work of an evangelist? Yes, in one form or another, it is. And uh, what is an evangelist? Well, the word uh, is, is spelled, actually, the translation from the Greek uh, is E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-S-T-E-S. 
Evangelistes. And uh, it's not with a V, but it's with a U. But we would call it evangelist. And uh, it comes from two words. EU means good or well. And uh, angelos means messenger. Angelos, which is the same word for angel, is messenger. Of course, there are heavenly messengers and there are earthly messengers, right? Uh, preachers are called angelos in the scriptures, and so are the angels of God called angelos because they're, they're messengers, okay? So an evangelist is uh, a messenger of good, one who brings the message of the good news of what God has done. And there's evangelizo, which is evangelize, you know, and then there is evangelion, which means the gospel. The gospel is also uses the same word. The good news also uses the same word. So this doing the work of an evangelist is very important or we're not going to have this geometric progression. You know, we talk to our neighbors when we get a chance. We talk to our children. We, as God, we see God opening a door. We knock a little bit and we see if the door is open. And if it is, we walk on in and we share a little bit of the gospel. We try to do it gracefully, as some people are very poor at doing. <laughs> but, but we need to learn to, do, to be weak to the weak and to love people and to be interested in not just telling them how much we know, but bringing them into the kingdom. And um, so we'll study this more and more, I think. But right now, I'm just going to talk about the basics. And uh, I think I'm going to go back and look at Romans chapter 5. So, so we can understand this uh, geometric progression a little better, okay? Let's go down to, excuse me, Romans 4 and 16. For this cause, it is of faith that it may be according to grace to the end that the promise may be sure to all of the seed not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all so think about this Abraham is the father of us all but Abraham would have been awful busy if he was the father of us all, right, in the natural. And yet, Paul, who wrote Romans, is saying that Abraham was his father. But he's way on down the chain here, you know, uh, from Abraham. You know, there, what he's saying is the seed of Abraham actually went through Abraham's seed and then grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and followed one lineage all the way down to the Apostle Paul because he said, of us all. So it's the same way today, folks. We have a job to do. You know, we've got to have children. You know, every one of us has got to have children for this geometric progression to go on, you know. He says, which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made thee. Well, truly, he brought forth the patriarchs, and the patriarchs went forth and brought forth children who went forth and brought forth children in a great geometric progression right on down to us. See, that's the pattern that we see there. And if, if every one of us is not doing our job, you know, as children of God, uh, then this is not going to happen. It's just not going to work. And this is, what, this is what actually destroyed the geometric progression is the Nicolaitan error. Okay, preacher, we, we hire you. You get up there. You tell us how it is. And if we, anybody gets saved, we're going to bring them in here and let you teach them. And you tell them how to be saved, which is something never should happen in the church anyway. Evangelizing doesn't happen in the church. And the church is for teaching the church is for teaching the saints and raising them up as disciples, okay? You go outside the church to evangelize because evangelism is to the lost. You go out and you bring them the gospel. You, not the preacher, you. You share the gospel with them. You know, it's your children, you see. Paul was one of those children of Abraham 
but there were many, many fathers in between the two. And so each one of us, if we really love God, we're going to love his sheep. We're going to want to find them. We're going to want to bring them in. Okay. And this is a job for every one of us as children of Abraham. He says, a father of many nations have I made thee before him whom he believed, even God, who giveth life to the dead and calleth the things that be not, that are not as though they were, who in hope believed against hope to the end that he might become a father of many nations. Notice, notice Abraham was walking by faith in order to be a father of many nations. You know, we can't do this on our own. We have to go to God first. We have to walk by faith. It is God who will do this through us. It's his seed, you know. We're just the vessel through whom he sows it, right? It is his seed. It is his word. We need the anointing from him. We need the power of the Spirit from him. We need to go to him by faith in order to be the father of many children, Okay, so he believed God, and it wasn't in vain. According as that which hath been spoken, so shall thy seed be. It's still true of us, folks. I mean, look, how many between Paul, who said he was one of these, and Abraham passed on their lineage in that way. And now in the New Testament, he's telling us it's spiritual. It's not physical. It isn't the children of of Abraham through the flesh. Let me read that to you and we'll come right back there. Romans 9 and verse 6 it says, But it's not as though the word of God have come to naught, for there are not all Israel that are of Israel. In other words, natural inheritance, right? Natural children of Abraham. Neither because they are Abraham's seed, physically that is, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, it's not the children of the flesh that are the children of God, but it's the children of the promise that are reckoned for a seed. Reckoned for a seed. And the Bible, of course, says in Galatians 4 that, uh, that you now are children of promise. So we are children of promise. We are reckoned as a seed. And we also need to bring forth children, you know, because we sow the same seed. And it said of Abraham back in chapter 4, he says, who in hope believed against hope to the end that he might be a father of many nations, according as it has been spoken, so shall thy seed be. So, praise the Lord, we still haven't seen the gospel brought to all the world. And Abraham's seed is still going to be with us until the end of the age. And without being weakened in faith, he considered his own body now as good as dead, he being about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, and yet looking unto the promise of God, he wavered not through unbelief, but waxed strong through faith, giving glory to God. Well, I say we, we have to do the same thing. We need to pray for offspring. We need to pray for children, every one of us. You know, all of us who can sow the seed of the Word of God in some form or fashion, we can do this. We need to pray that God will give us fruit. We know that we pray for God to give us fruit in ourselves, the fruit of Jesus Christ. Of course, you can't pass on something that you don't have. We need the fruit of Jesus Christ before we can pass on the fruit of Jesus Christ in bringing forth fruit in other people, right? And uh, some people uh, totally pervert the Word of God into saying, you know, it's, it's only souls that you get to accept Jesus as their personal Savior is your fruit. No, if we don't bear the fruit of Jesus Christ, we're not going to enter the kingdom of God. And if we're not in the kingdom of God, we can't beget God's seed. See, we, we have to enter the kingdom here. And this is where we beget God's seed. And verse 21 says, And being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able to perform. God, in other words, he believed that God was capable and able to bring forth his seed in other souls here. Wherefore also it was reckoned 
unto him for righteousness. So basically, basically uh, he was reckoned righteous because he believed that God could bring forth this seed in him. Praise be to God. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was reckoned unto him, but for our sake also, unto whom it shall be reckoned who believe on him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who has delivered us, who has delivered up for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Praise God. So basically, as Abraham believed God and God brought him forth fruit, uh, that is other souls, uh, so it is now in evangelism that uh, we are each called to do the work of an evangelist, not necessarily have the office of evangelist, but to do the work of evangelist in bringing forth other souls in order to bring forth this geometric progression uh, that is uh, multiplying, multiplying, okay? Uh, and in the days to come, when once again God anoints and blesses His people, with the latter rain anointing, uh, the power of God is going to be with his people to multiply, have a, a, an ex exceedingly great revival, similar to what happened in Jesus' day. You can imagine people were just rocking along in Jesus' day, following religion, you know, fulfilling their obligations to go to church, and uh, yet there was no such thing as revival. But Jesus was the revival. And now we're about to walk down this same road in uh, a much broader path this time because it's going to happen all over the world. And uh, God's going to raise up a man-child to raise up apostles, to uh, raise up the five-fold ministry, to raise up the people, to have a revival that's going to go around the world. Praise God. So... God's plan of evangelism, uh, I think that, that uh, we need to study diligently how to be able to get across to people this good gift of God's kingdom, this good gift of the knowledge of God, of the good news. We need to study to be able to get this uh, across to people without necessarily offending them on our part. Many people will be offended. They're always offended with the gospel. But he that's of God hears the words of God. Praise be to God. They will hear. You know, Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. So they will hear and they will come. And uh, we're not far. We're not far. We've already started down this road, I believe. I believe that the John the Baptist ministries are are out there doing their work right now. And the next thing we're going to see is the, the man-child ministry. Praise be to God. And um, we're greatly looking forward to it. I know I can see that in our own ministry, God is preparing us. He's preparing us. He's preparing us. He's been working towards this, the beginning of this man-child ministry. And um, he's opening doors like never before. And uh, we're just greatly excited to uh, see what God's about to do. Thank you so much for joining us today. The Lord bless you.